Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me on this Friday afternoon in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. Academy Award winner Lee Grant's films have become some of the most influential of the new Hollywood era. She is a survivor of the Hollywood blacklist. She's the first female director to be honored by the Directors Guild of America. She is well known to movie audiences and fans around the world for uh, her iconic roles in some of the most recognizable series and films of the last six decades, including In the Heat of the Night, The Valley of the Dolls, Columbo, Peyton Place, Search for Tomorrow, and Shampoo, for which she won an Academy Award. Her work as a director has also been ground brown groundbreaking, earning her another Academy Award for the documentary Down and Out in America. Lee is here today to discuss her incredible career in show business and the 2020 re-release of her work behind the camera, 20th Century Woman, the documentary films of Lee Grant. The film became America's first visual, virtual repertory film series as Grant continues to break ground even now. She will soon be featured in the new movie, Killian and the Comeback Kids, which hit, hits theaters this fall. Please welcome to the locker room, Academy Award winner, Lee Grant. Hi, Lee. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for being here. Oh, please, thank you for asking. It's, it's my pleasure. And like I said, fans are so excited you're here. And I, I did homework, which we'll get to, but I, I, I am sad to say I only just saw Shampoo for the first time, which I <laughs> adored. And I watched your uh, amazing documentary uh, about the transgender community, which I thought was fascinating, especially for the, the period of time that you did it in. Um, but I wanted to start, I read a quote that is attributed to you, and I, I'm curious if you remember it. Many of the things I have accomplished in life are because I was dead set of proving somebody wrong. Do you remember saying that? I don't remember saying it, but uh, but I, I certainly understand it, and it certainly is a core, an absolute core for me. I mean, I know... Uh, why I said it, <laughs> I, I know that it that it was a great source of power for me uh, to get back and 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 to show whoever it was. Uh, I I'd forgotten it, but thank you for reminding me because it it, it 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 it's it sounds like a, a very determined woman. Yeah. When you think about the fact that you, you know, I said the last six decades that you've worked all this time, what does that, you know, how does that feel for you? Well, it, it, you know, the decades were broken up. It mm -hmm. was, it was the kid decade. I'm not saying real kid because I was, you know, 22 or something when I got the Oscar. You know, so that's, you know, between a grown up and a kid. Uh, and then the next decade, uh, I was blacklisted and, and mm. I couldn't work in film or, or television. So that was the decade when I really was educated politically. <clears throat> mm. You know, that was the decade when when my college was to to get to to create an army of good people to fight the blacklisters. And, and I think that everything that happened after that, I think the documentaries and certainly the acting after that and the, the kind of directors, and the kind of director, the movies that I was in were fighting movies. They were, um, they, they were part of the new era of the new 70s and 80s that had never happened before. So I could not have been more down, and then I could not have been more up. And, you, and then for I sure. aged out. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, you definitely were down and definitely were up. Yeah. Um, and I and I will get to the blacklist, but I'm curious. I mean, you you really, I, I don't know how long, if, if ever you lived in Los Angeles, but you you are a true born and bred New Yorker. What was your childhood like in New York growing up? Oh, I'm a Washington Heights girl, uh, 148th Street and Riverside Drive. 
and I'm just a block away of Riverside Drive now. So wow. I'm, I'm home. You know, I'm very comfortable here. Broadway is one block up and Riverside is one block down. Uh, and that's where I was raised. Uh, and I love it here. And I'm a New Yorker. You know, I, I, uh, it's, my, it's my water. If I were a fish, this is my water. <laughs> That is a great, and I love that. That is fantastic. Did you have movie idols yourself growing up? Yes. Yes. <laughs> My first crush was Lawrence Olivier in Wuthering Heights. And I left the movie house at 148th Street at Broadway and walked down to my apartment in a daze in love. And... <laughs> And it, you know, and it, and it went from there. You know, whoever stole my heart afterwards. Yeah, but he was he he was the first. And, yeah. and and I know you know early on you you uh, joined the American Ballet as an adolescent. You I think attended the Juilliard School of Music, the High School of Music and Art. Um, how did you decide at an early age to get into ballet and the arts? didn't have my choice. My mother, <laughs> my <laughs> mother <laughs> raised me uh, first to be a dancer, then to do some acting. But I mean, the dancing was serious. It was from four till 10, really, uh, that she dragged me down every week to the Metropolitan Opera ballet class. Uh, the fact that I have flat feet and that I was a, a pudgy baby uh, had no meaning for her. Uh, the fact that I, I was not built ever to be a, a, a great ballet dancer had no meaning for her. This was her heart. This was, you know, this was her aim. And, and uh, the thing that stopped it really, because she did get me into the American ballet. And the little girl who accompanied me to the American Ballet, Rosemarie Conradi, was a genius. Uh, and she was my age. And she developed tuberculosis of the spine Oof. and could not dance anymore. But she, she was one of those genius dancers where I was a klutz who could move her arms. <laughs> You know, I could get by. And and so my father said no more dancing. Um, and then it went into acting. And, and you won a scholarship, I believe, right? To the Neighborhood Playhouse? Yeah, the second year I did. And, and studying under Sanford Meisner, what was he like? Frightening and stimulating? Uh, you know, frightening and stimulating really says it well. Uh, yes. Uh, he was from the group theater, so uh, he got his Stanislavski right from Stanislavski himself. And he was a very sharp uh, tyrant, uh, which I needed. And he called me on all my being a spoiled Riverside Drive girl and straightened me out and, and everything I learned in those two years about being a committed artist uh, was from those two years with Sandy. Interesting. So I, I was never an actor, but I took an acting class that studied the Meisner technique. So oh. when you were studying, was it uh, back then, was it about the repetition and no. sort of, no. no? Not at all, not at all. But it was about objectives and actions and uh, um, and, and the, that concentration, which cuts everything else out. Amazing. And, and do you, I mean, you said like the two years, do you attribute all of it to that? Like you really soaked yes. all of it in? Everything, every, every, every character that I ever did after that, including a detective story, including the shoplifter. I, I had an assignment uh, in speech class 
to pick up another person's personality, another person's accent, another person's way of talking, and to bring it into class. And so when I went up for my audition and detective story, you know, I couldn't do the ingenue because she was an idiot. But I said, can I do the old lady who was the shoplifter? And that's and that was from character study at the neighborhood playhouse. In wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and I, I believe you made your Broadway debut in Joy to the World in 1948. What do you... Oh, gosh. I was understudying. I didn't really make it. There was no Broadway debut until Detective Story. I was gotcha. I was an understudy before Detective Story for a couple of shows. Gotcha. And Detective Story was your first uh, motion picture with oh, Kirk yeah. Douglas. Yeah. And you earned your first Academy Award nomination. What I mean, do you remember that feeling of hearing your name as a nominee for your first film? Alan, oh. this is going to disappoint you. So. Yeah. This is going to disappoint you. <laughs> By that time, I was going with my husband-to-be, Arnie, who was, as you know, a communist to uh, all of his friends. He was a great writer. He had written a play that uh, I had left Detective Story to be in on Broadway, which closed in two weeks. And I honestly... The Oscars meant nothing to me. I didn't know what was going on. You know, it was, it was like, so what? And, and you know, I won the Cannes Film Festival mm -hmm. for Best Actress in the World that year, too. And I didn't know what that was about. I, I, that I read. You didn't know what that was. They, they sent me what looked like a menu, and you <laughs> open it up, and it said Best Actress can film festival and it had a picture of a, a lady w coming out of a chauffeured car you know with high heels and long dress and i didn't know you know what they were talking about i didn't know what the can film festival was. you know you get these awards when you're too stupid to know what you're getting well sometimes that might even just help you be a little more humble, you know, when you're not knowing, but it's nice to know that people are, you know, admiring your work. It certainly was 10 years afterwards. It certainly <laughs> was, you know, when I was grew up a little and, and wasn't such a kind of child girl because I was, you know, I'd only, I'd only lived with my parents and then moved in with my husband to be, you know, so, and I was not educated. You know, I, I barely graduated high school. I was thrown out of music and art because I didn't <laughs> attend classes, you know, and, and I was, you know, sent to the Bronx to high school for a while. I, I only went there because all the boys were on the train going up. To the <laughs> you know, they were going to Dewey Clinton. And I was the only girl on the train. And the only thing I was ever was boy crazy. You know, <laughs> I just I just wanted boys around me all the time. I was a, a flirt and, and and you know, just it took up all of my genes. That's all I cared about were boys, boys, boys. I and love then I that. finally graduated from, from George Washington. And, um, and there was a teacher there, an English teacher there, David Wilkins, who saw that I had a talent in English. And it was my first real connection in any class. And it, it served me well. Hmm. Interesting. And then early in your career, you appeared as Rose Peabody on Search for Tomorrow. And there's a lot of daytime fans watching right now. <laughs> what do you remember about playing Rose? Well, you know, they were very dear people. And they hired me when I was blacklisted. You know, so they were taking a real chance. And I, I, Rose was the cook. And, and so the shots of me were always me in the kitchen, stirring the soup, 
in which I put poison. <laughs> boys in the family with so the shots that i really remember you know is you know what will you have for dinner and then back in the kitchen they show me stirring the soup that has the poison in it and and i was the big sister to a little brother who was sick in uh, and, and then they said you know no more rose and that was the end of that wow well, that's pretty brave because I think Search for Tomorrow was owned by Procter and Gamble, and I love that they took a risk, you well, know, you on know somebody. Uh, it wasn't until that blacklister in Syracuse attacked Procter and Gamble and attacked their products in his in his huge store, food store, grocery store, that they finally crumbled and gave in. They fell under pressure. Oh, yes. A lot of pressure. Hmm. And, and you worked with the lovely Mary Stewart, who played Joe, and Don Knotts, who played your brother. Yes. Do you what, what do you remember about both of them? Re really, you know, the whole experience was funny and fun. You know, the whole character was so ridiculous. <laughs> you know, and, and of course, Don was my sick younger brother, so he was always in a cot. And so either I was malevolent because I wanted to kill the family, or I was kind because I was taking care of my brother. So, you know, it, it didn't have much depth. It just was a check coming in when yeah. I really needed it. I can imagine. I, I mean... I can imagine. Can you, I mean, talk about the blacklist so, you know, people watching today understand, I, you know, I know a lot of people know that you were blacklisted, but if you can elaborate and. Well, uh, you know, I, I wrote a book mm -hmm. uh, about, oh, I don't know, seven, eight years ago called I Said Yes to Everything was the title. And really, the, the view I have of myself in that time is like Candide. You know, wherever I'm bumping to, wherever life takes me, that's where I went. You know, except for acting, which was my life and my love and my fierceness, um, I was learning. Every day. I was just bumping along, you know, falling in love with a communist, and, and therefore I was blacklisted for the next 12 years, so that I was blacklisted at 24. I didn't get off it until I was 36. So you know that those years are your prime years, certainly in Hollywood. I did get to work on Broadway because... Uh, Actors Equity and, and the producers had a pact never to have a blacklist on Broadway. But those parts were few and far between. And so basically, I became a very political person in fighting the blacklist and organizing to get rid of the blacklisters, huh. and, which at a certain point I won. But that was my life. And it was my education. And it, it served me very well in my later years when I turned to making documentaries. Because it opened up a much deeper part of myself, I would say. I was pretty shallow. I was pretty, you know, vapid as an adolescent. And as, a, a, you know, a young wife um, married to somebody much older and much more educated than me who didn't really love me. You know, I was very useful. He had two little boys and I was the au pair. You know, I cooked, I took care of the boys and and so served as a wife um, but uh, an unhappy wife. Did you understand that he, when the, early on that he was a communist and did you understand when the blacklist happened, 
what it what it was? No, I just found that both he and his friends, and we lived at 444 Central Park West, and there were at least 15 families there who either the man or the woman was a communist. Wow. And, and, and a lot of them came from working class parents uh, from the unions um, and, and from that, the unions came from the people who were communists. But they were American communists. They weren't Russian communists. And they were brilliant and important to me. And the intellectuals who decided to be communists were fascinating people. And, and the whole news and the whole uh, uh, intake on what was happening in Russia was just never a, a part of the information they got. It wasn't until Khrushchev took over and said what a killer Stalin was that, that they understood that what they'd been looking up to all those years was a fraud. Not only a fraud, but a, 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 a murderous fraud who went after all of the artists who were like them, all the poets and writers in the so-called Soviet Union were sent to gulags and prisons and, and quieted. You know, the, the absurdity of that hero worship, the absurdity of it during all those years. Hmm. You, you know, for all those gorgeous people who were idealists, you know, this was, they went to fight in the Spanish Civil War. You know, they were idealists. But the wow. reality of what was really going on was was missing until, <laughs> you know, Khrushchev came in and, and, and told the world. And my husband at that time, you know, went into his office in the apartment and shut the door and didn't come out. Was wow. so shocked and so painful, you know. And you uh, spoke before the Un-American Activities Committee. So, so what did that experience of the blacklist and speaking in front of the committee teach you? Well, I, I never ever had a conflict. <laughs> you know, I was never conflicted about giving names. Uh, and the one, of course, that they went after the most was my husband. You know, and while I know that there were a lot of successful, successful communist couples, writers in Hollywood, who said, okay, I'll name you if you name me. And that it became a, a way of going back to work as screenwriters and, and earning a, a living. And I certainly understood it. He was a communist. And for the idea naming anyone to go to work on television uh, was so absurd to me hmm. uh, as, as a human being and, and as an actor. I wouldn't dream of that. How dare they? How dare they? Um, but that was the condition to name my husband. And so um, and so I taught. I taught at uh, Berghoff Hagen School. And, uh, and whenever a play came up on Broadway that I was right for, I worked on Broadway. And I organized with Madeline Lee, who was my little union friend. And, and we organized to get the people who were running after us the American Federation of Television and Radio, the president of that organization and all of his co-runners of it 
were the ones who were picking out actors who came to the union meetings and giving them to the blacklisters. So our own people, our own union was blacklisting its own members. And so our fight, Madeline's and mine in that period, was to get a very decent person to run against them and to dethrone them. And we uh. did. We got John Henry Falk, who uh, I could say was a hero. He had a radio program that was very popular, but he heard us and he understood us. And he organized a slate of people to run against the after people. And he won, but he lost his job. You know, he was he was blacklisted too. Well, when I look at that list of, I mean, the, the list of people who were on that blacklist, it was enormous. And it was the best actors <laughs> yeah. at the time. It's well, crazy. Millions of dollars. He brought he brought them to court, and and he he really got back at them because the court awarded him millions of dollars and, and sanctioned. And the grocer who got me off the soap opera, mm -hmm. he died in a motel the day that he was to testify. Wow, I can't believe that it was one grocer that fought that hard to get you off. But that's, you know, it didn't take much. I guess, yeah. It didn't take much. The, the, it was so sensitive and it was so stupid. So stupid. Crazy. So your first role, I believe, after the blacklist was that of Stella Chernak on Peyton Place. Yeah. What do you remember by about way, your... By the way, yeah. as, soon as, as soon as the Un-American Activities Committee sent me a clearance, was while I was in New York. I mean, I started working every place before, before Stella Chernak. I mean, those directors and producers could not wait, you know, to hire me. I, I was just uh, on every show, every single week, and, and flown to London to, you know, it, it was uh, an embarrassment of riches. Well, that must have felt absolutely wonderful after those 12 years of the blacklist. It, you know, it was like biblical. It was the drought and then the rain <laughs> came. <laughs> you know, that is a great it, way to more, think. More, more, more showers. <laughs> that, that is a great way to say it. Well, that's... <laughs> Let's talk about Stella, because I know fans loved you on Peyton Place. It, 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 you won an Emmy for it. What, what do you, you know, what stands out in your mind about Stella and Peyton? Well, well, talk again so I can make sure I've got you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, first of all, New York's New York. We moved to Malibu. It wasn't just California, it was Malibu. <laughs> and I had a, a pool house in Malibu <laughs> and my little cutie boyfriend, Joey, who I've been married to for 60 years now, you know, came out and my daughter, Dinah, Dinah Manoff, mm -hmm. whose book has just come out so extraordinary. And who will be who will be here on Wednesday? Oh, great! Well, she was like seven or eight then. You know, she was going to school in Malibu, and right above the pool, the pool reflected the Bank of America, which was over my house. I mean, it was so beautiful that it was unreal. You know, and the water, the beach was, you know, right there, and it it was heaven. It was it was literally heaven. I just ran in the sand and got to my knees and said, Thank you, thank you, whoever, thank you for making this even more beautiful than the past was sad and terrible. You know? Thank you for teaching me how to fight too. And what and what do you remember about the Emmy for Peyton? I remember Frank Sinatra coming over to me 
and sing. Don't be scared. You made it. You're all right. Because he sensed he was going with Mia at the time. He sensed that I, I thought, you know, like the FBI would be all over me and take me off the stage and, <laughs> and say, well, it's not really true. You're really blacklisted. You know, I couldn't believe the journey, you know, from being out to being so in. And, of course, I love the character of Stella. She's, what did you love about her? Well, first of all, she's from the other side of the pond. She's an outcast. You know, she's tough, and she's protecting her brother. And, uh, and so she had all that rebellion in her that I had. So it wasn't sweet and hello and, you know. It wasn't Mia, it wasn't Barbara, it was tough girl, tough girl from the other side of the tracks. And I was tough, and I am tough. And it, it was so good to have that outlet at that hmm. time. And, and you worked with another soap legend, uh, Ruth Warwick, who played Hannah Cord. What do you remember about Ruth? Just her charm, you know, and I'd seen her in, in uh, that Orson Welles movie where she played the wife, you know, and the feeling that I was talking to a legend mm -hmm. and just a charming woman. And, and you know, it's, it was not often that older actresses got parts on any of the television shows. And so, you know, I felt that Peyton Place was very open and gracious about older actresses. That's awesome. And then you appeared as the distraught widow of a murder victim in the Oscar winning In the Heat of the Night and as Miriam in Valley of the Dolls. <laughs> any, any, <laughs> why do you laugh? What makes you laugh? Wait a minute, this keeps yeah, yeah. falling out. I, I keep losing it. Um, uh, <laughs> yes, a little, little, what made opposite, you laugh? Little opposite, um, well, one for the money, two for the show, <laughs> three to get ready, four to go. You know, <laughs> um, what, whatever was offered to me, I had been starved for so long. Well, and you were just ready. And work. I, I was not ready. I was hungry. Mm. I was starved. I was starved. It's like, oh, Peyton, like, no, 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 more, more, more. You needed to shed that creativity. You needed I to. Need, I, I was so fraught, fraught with the need to work. It, it was like. You know, it was like a starvation. I, what have you got here? For, what have you got? You know, mom, oh, mom, oh, oh, I'm just cannot get enough. That's incredible. It was wonderful. You know, it was such a, you know, how long will this last? Maybe it won't last. Yeah, I guess after that experience, you you, you know, you'll take what what comes. And I was old. I was 39. Nah. I was, listen, 39 in Hollywood is the beginning of the end of your career. And, and at that time, much more than I think today. But yes, it really was, right? And so I had to hide it. And so I was always lying. <laughs> <laughs> I was always lying about my age and, and had fear of, of that my age would be exposed. I had lunch with the mayor of Los Angeles and he took four years off of my driver's license, you know, so I'd be 32. Oh. It, you know, I mean, I, I was possessed with the fear that my age would take away the work from me because all of the parts I was getting were younger parts, you know. Wow. So, so my my whole um, 
focus was on hiding, hiding my age, changing my birth date, and and uh, and keeping on working, keeping on working. You, you had a goal to work. Um, a lot of our fans were asking uh, if you have memories of sh working with Sharon Tate on Valley of the Dolls. Of course. Of course. <laughs> um, delicious, the sweetness, the kind of self-containment that she had. She was very self-contained and she was very much in love and uh, and and it was only our scenes where we were together in Valley of the Dolls. I didn't have scenes with anybody else except except a little bit with a boy who played my brother. But all of my scenes were with Sharon, and so we got to hang out. and And she was just a lovely, charming creature who was madly in love. Hmm. Yeah, and I mean, you really have a, a wealth of riches with all of your nominations and your winnings. You you received three Academy Award nominations, The Landlord, Shampoo, and Voyage of the Damned. Now I told you, I you know, before having to do this with you, I was so excited to watch Shampoo because it's a movie I've really always wanted to watch and so much fun. Did you have fun making that? was the most fun movie. Yeah. I think thousands and thousands of actors would like claw to do <laughs> that movie. It was it was so sexy. It was yeah. so sexy that the hairdressers had wet dreams. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> it's still sexy though today. <laughs> I mean, the atmosphere on the set, it, it, you know, we were always crawling into bed and crawling out of bed, and you were crawling into bed with the really sexiest boy in the world, and and it was a steaming set, and Goldie was my friend, Goldie Horn was my friend, and Julie Christie had just been going with Warren. And oh, they had wow. split up right before we did shampoo. And so I was the one going to bed with him. So, it, you know, who could ask for anything more? And it opens, the movie opens with you in bed <laughs> with him. Right. Right. You're, you're right there. It opens with you in bed with him. It was and, better than an Academy Award. It was, it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was so cool. Well, then that Academy Award for something so fun must yes. have really been must have been icing on the cake. Oh, it was. It was. What do you remember about winning that? I remember that as I mean, first of all, it was astonishing because I had been nominated for so many Academy Awards. And, and then when they announced the name, it wasn't mine. And so all of that public attention, which go, oh, look here, Lee, look here, Lee, turned into, get out of the way, Lee, you know, <laughs> can you move over? You're in the way, you know. So I had been nominated before and really, you know, kind of, you know, shoved afterwards. So I really was not sure if I was going to get it this time. But as I was walking up the aisle, I thought, this is it. I'm 49. I'm 49. I will not have this chance again. Mm. I, I have to start thinking about something else because I do not want to become one of those, you know, actors who waits and waits for the jobs to come and they're not coming and I'm too old. Uh, the way women actors are treated in Hollywood, being over the hill, is 
despicable. It's despicable. You know, during this COVID-19 thing, I've been watching all those English television series one after like, another. After like another. which ones? Detective this, detective that. I mean, <laughs> I, I can't tell you the name. The one is called The Innocence. The Innocence. And, and any one of those things from Ireland or, or from London or from Australia, all of them have older character actors, one after another, fat, skinny, old, gray, and doing work, doing the work that only an older actor can do, that are so brilliant, that are so exciting and thrilling to me, you know? And, and, and so that whole, that, that, that whole American need for youth destroying the talents of the older actors that we have here is an anathema. And we have just as many brilliant ones. Oh my gosh, yes. Our character actors are just you know, so, so that whole, that, that this whole time, this pandemic time of, you know, watching all of these great actors and all these series, old actors, old, and also not attractive. One has a belly, one has missing teeth, one has, one has no chin. I mean, Re real looking women. They're treasured for what they look like, because they look like people you see on the street. They're real. Yeah. They're real. real. They no. don't have to look pretty. They're real. So true. What do you recall about uh, Airport 77? Did you, <laughs> did you think it was fun to do or just a crazy story with, of course, a paycheck at the end? Well, it was a crazy story with a paycheck, which, <laughs> um, which I was very, very aware of during my time in Hollywood. I, I wanted that paycheck. I needed that paycheck. I was very aware of my responsibility. I had a little girl, and I had a house, and I had a boyfriend uh, who was becoming a producer at that time. But... Um, but I needed that income, and I did a lot of movies that I wouldn't have done. Uh, like, the bees are coming, you know. But, mm -hmm. uh, but was Airport seventy seven one of those, or you enjoyed that still? I enjoyed, I enjoyed that, but it was certainly n not one that 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 I thought, oh my God, I can really grow. In this. But I had a lot of fun, and. Um, uh, Olivia de Havilland was in it, and, and oh, Brenda and I had a fight. Brenda was the, uh, what do you call the, the, the woman who walks up and down the, the thing. Flight attendant. Yeah, Brenda Bacall. Brenda yep. Bacall, my friend. <laughs> Everybody went to her house every weekend to get stoned. She was... <laughs> She, I mean, she was smoking, drinking, and never thinking. She was, she was the flight attendant. Uh. And so, there's a time in the in the movie when I get so crazy when my husband is drowned, and I want to open the door to the plane, and it would flood the plane. So she, Brenda has to suck me, and so that I fall to the floor and I don't endanger all the passengers. Right, so she starts to go to slap me, and we both like fall to the floor laughing. You can't get up and do it. It's so funny. And finally, the director says, "Stop laughing, you guys! Stop laughing!" I mean, we just were giggling hard. And so she I mean... finally slapped me, and I went down. But I went down laughing. I went down laughing. I love that. I mean, it's it's a funny movie. So it's probably when you're making something like that, it's hard not to, 
not to, you know, let it out. And I had in my contract that a double would dive into the water, you know, when the plane goes down, that a double that I wouldn't have to, you know, jump into You didn't want to dive. I didn't want to dive. <laughs> and when we got to the scene, Olivia de Havilland said, oh, can I be the first to dive in the water? <laughs> I was standing there. I was so ashamed, and I didn't want her or anybody else to know that I wouldn't <laughs> dive in the water. So, and when they said, Lee, we have your dog, and I said, no, 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 that's, you know, you got it wrong. No, no, that, that I'm, I'm supposed to dive too. But it says, here, no, no, really, I, I want to dive. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. I love that. <laughs> You didn't want, yeah, I love that. That is a great story. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Uh, one of our fans, Matthew, he he asked if you had any memories of defending your life because he had to watch it for a philosophy class in college and then had to write papers on it. And he says your performance was incredible. And if I'm not mistaken, I hear you were wearing... Um, a costume from that movie yesterday. And I'm wearing one from it today. <laughs> and I'm wearing one. This this little satin blouse was all, I wore a, the red one yesterday. And I'm wearing the other one today because I love wearing the things from, and these are beautiful blouses. And I never would wear it otherwise. Yeah, this was made for me for, for playing the lawyer. You know, with a, one of those jackets on top of it, so that I'm business-like. Yeah. But isn't it lovely? Lovely, and I love that you still have it. Do you have a lot of? I have uh, a lot. Yes, I kept almost everything. Wow. Of, of the things that I loved. Yeah, yes, I, I pieces hold up. If you if you love the clothing and it holds up, why not? Right. Oh, it's also, it's also memories. You know, you put letters away. You put you know, trinkets and, and jewelry away. And and this has such good memories attached to it. You know, it's a place I've been. And yeah, sorry. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like a warm blanket almost, you know, brings back some exactly. happy Yeah, brings it back happy exactly. times. Yes. Yeah. That's the people. That's awesome. And making the transition. Oh, did, you, did it fall out? Yeah. I hate these things. <laughs> I really do. Um, and you made the transition from acting to directing. Was that a conscious choice or what, what made? Well, I, I do think that the seed was planted walking down the aisle to get the Oscar that, you know, my time as an employable leading lady or a great character part was ending. And then uh, um, the uh, Academy, what's the name of the, uh, of the place where I was trained? Oh, the, uh, yes, sorry, the um, American Film Institute. Yeah, AFI. Uh, yeah. American Film Institute called and said they were starting a women's directing workshop. And there were like eight people they invited. And I made a short film out of a Stringberg piece. That the I Stronger. Made. Yes, The Stronger. Uh, with Susie Strasberg and Dolores Dorn. And the, the uh, canvas. Because um, Hmm. I keep hitting these things. The canvas of the stronger was a dining room. And and when you see it on stage, it's two women seated at a table and they talk. And and here at the American Film Institute, which was like a marble palace, I had I had horses. Horses and a carriage coming up carrying Susan Strasberg. I had a chorus of children singing to her when she got 
out of the carriage. I had this marble staircase that she went down. I had uh, two girls doing the cello and the violin, and the rest was a restaurant full of people coming and going. And she was the leading lady of, of this theater that was there. And down at the bottom of the stairs was Dolores Dorn on a, a chaise lung, smoking a, 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 with a cigarette holder and watching her come down the stairs because which one of those two was the strong? Which one of those two women was the strong? Now, Susan did all the talking. Oh, I'm a leading lady, and I'm in this, and I'm in that, and my husband, and my children, and my children, and my husband. Oh, yes, I, oh, I'll give you an autograph, of course. And this, and this, and this. And, and for the half hour that the stronger went on, she never stopped talking. <laughs> never, never. I mean, it was a, a, an absolutely bravura performance. And, and Dolores, in that amount of time, was like a poised snake. You know, she was listening and she was coiled, but you knew, you knew who was the strong. Huh. And, and so the, the adventure of doing that, and I had a great uh, cameraman, Andy Davis was a great cameraman doing it, who was assigned to it. And that became the keynote of all the films that I directed after. I had a, a hand in hand with the camera man because I never knew much about camera. I was always in front of it. Yeah, for but sure. I had, a partner. I had a partner on every film I, I made and, and they were great camera people. Did you fall Amazing. Did you Amazing. Fall Did you fall asleep, Justin? No, not at all. I had a question about what do you think um, your years of acting, um, how have the years of your acting helped you be a better director? I, uh, I think in the years of the acting, of course, but I would never hire anybody who wasn't a great actor, you know. And all of the people in the films were great actors. You know, they were all Stanislavski people. They all studied. You're going to sleep. No. <laughs> I'm loving this. I'm fascinated by your stories. Anyway. Fascinated. That's fascinated. Right. And um, your documentaries are available now online. What's it been like revisiting them now that they are available for everyone of all generations to see? I think, you know, I am, I am grateful. I'm grateful for the chance to hold up a mirror to what's going on around us. Uh, I, I made uh, TV movies out of almost all the documentaries that I made because so few people watch documentaries, but they watch it on television. When I turn it into drama, uh, the movie Homeless is running, I think it's on Amazon, uh, along with the documentary uh, Down and Out in America. Uh, so that Which you won an Academy Award for. Which which we won an Academy Award for, and and, uh, and all of those things came, I think, from the blacklist, all of the need to do documentaries and to hold a mirror up to what's happening, what's unfair, what's, what's cruel, what's mean, what's- You, you, what's you mean your desire to do the documentaries came out of the blacklist and I, your desire to- Yes, yeah. I believe it. when I say that was my education, I yeah. think that, that formed, you know, my point of view on, on everything. So I think the, the documentaries and holding that mirror up to the unfairness that goes on in life is, you know, was a, tr a true catalyst for me. Yeah. And like I said at the intro, I, I just watched What Sex Am I? 
fascinating look at the transgender community. Uh, you know, transgender um, issues are, are so much in the forefront today, but when you made that doc documentary, they were not at all. And you know, a lot of those, a, a lot of those boy girls died. A lot of them got AIDS. A lot of them, a lot of them hurt themselves. And to me, oh my God, what a, what a bunch of great people, great people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, great um, people that you featured in there. But you've directed many documentaries on a variety of social issues, women in prison, transgender, like I mentioned, women experiencing domestic abuse, the farm workers losing their farms. Is, is there one that stands out as your favorite? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I, I think the permission to open the door to each of these places and be allowed to come in with a camera, with the trust of the people who I'm talking to, and ask anything that is, is open in their world for me to enter into their world was so thrilling and so exciting. I mean, as an actor, you enter into a fictitious world. As a documentary director, you're invited into a real world with real people that you can find out about. And they're so open and they're so, they're, they're, they so want to transmit what their pain is, what their joy is, what they need to say. They're given an opportunity to, to talk. And, and to show their lives. And, and they're so Comple interconnected. Completely. And, and that's why I think about, you know, what sex am I at the time that you did that? They were very brave. I, I know there were some who actually, you know, you, you only showed, the, showed their profile because they didn't want to be on camera. But there were many that you, you know, who were open and honest and put their lives right, th right there for you, which I... I found very brave at that time. I mean, we see so many transgender being uh, beat up today that, you know, I was very um, surprised to see so many be open with you. And also, you, you know, the opening guy, the one who had been a sailor and who was this tall gangling guy who had a daughter and who was married to this incredibly supportive woman. Who, who said yes she was I'm, yes I, i'm a woman he said i'm a woman and he he is the most unattractive woman that you know that i've ever filmed but that was okay with him the, the need to be who he was on the outside as much as he felt on the inside finally caught up with him and the bravery of of him you know having his hair plucked out of his yeah. being a, a maid of honor at his daughter's wedding instead of the daddy who gives her, I mean, what a mensch. Yeah, I, I couldn't take my eyes off the one at the end too. Steve Dane, I think is his name. Yes. But the, the I mean, the muscle guy and I think, and I just looked him up. I think he died of cancer at the age of 68. I heard but, he he was fascinated. He was. I mean, he. I mean, he looked as manly as could be. Like that was a real. Um, but he suffered. You know, he was. Fired. Yeah, fired. He, was he right. Fired. He was a gym teacher. Yes, a gym, te a gym teacher. Yeah. You know, the unfairness. You know, the one thing that gets all of these things together is unfairness. The unfairness of the blacklist and the unfairness of the position that these people are put in life. Hmm. That's the connecting thing. It, it's, it's not fair. Is there a story that you've always wanted to tell in a documentary, but have not been able to? Oh, yes. Yes. 
we, we did a documentary in Texas. Um, and it was about these judges in a certain section of Texas who took these young children away from the mothers when the children were like six, seven, eight, and gave them to the fathers because the mothers said they thought the children were being abused. They were permanently taken away from the mothers and permanently given to the fathers when one of the children said the abuse was going on, testified that the abuse was going on. Wow. That documentary was the last documentary we made for HBO. And HBO was sued by the judges in this documentary. And they had to pay out, you know, millions of dollars on it. So, you know, that was our last documentary for HBO. And that documentary can be shown, of course. But it was our best documentary of the moment. And, um, and I'm glad that we made it with all mm. that had happened, because at least what it did was to bring the children back to their mothers. Wow. For everybody watching, the link up, you can check out uh, Lee's films uh, at this link. You were the first woman to win the Directors Guild of America Award, the first female director to win the DGA Award for Nobody's Child. How did it feel to be the first woman? Oh, I just jumped up and down out, you know, we were <laughs> in New York at the time. And it was it was the best, including all the the the, the Oscars and everything. It, to, to get that award of best director from an almost all male director's guild. My people, my friends, my directors to say, Lee, this year, you're the best, you know. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I, I mean, the the um, women directors, it's such a uh, issue, you know, the lack of them. You know, what do you, you know, what do you feel about the, you know, the conversations going on about the lack of them trying to get more of them in and making films and documentaries. Well, I, I see a lot more women making, you know, first rate uh, studio films, uh, big films now, and uh, a lot more in television too, uh, you know, the wall has to break down completely, but I think that a lot of the rocks have been removed, and I think there's an awareness uh, now. Yeah, definitely an awareness. You know, and, and I think that it's happening. Maybe not happening fast enough, but it's happening. I, I, I agree. I wanted to ask, um, since document you love documentaries so much, for people watching, is there a documentary that you've watched in the last, you know, year or so, or, or in the last couple of years that you've really loved and you would recommend people to see? Um, well, you know, it was seeing a documentary. Um, and, and, you know, and I've gone blank. I can't tell you what it was can't tell you what it was and I can't. That's okay. I, I just I name? just watched the Natalie Wood one on HBO, which I really enjoyed because I didn't know oh, her whole yes. story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. But it was seeing a documentary at the same time as seeing my little first film that I made that turned me over. I had never seen a, a, a documentary like the one that was shown with the stronger and it just turned me over and from that first time documentaries were in my mind and, and you've been doing it ever since yeah what what do you love about being behind the camera 
Har, Har, uh, Taylor said Harlan County, USA. Was what? that Harlan County? Yes. Yes, yeah. Har, Harlan yeah. County, USA. And, and who was the director? Uh, Taylor might tell us in a second. He just told me. Okay. Yeah. Barbara Kappel, Koppel. That, that was the turning point for me. Because gotcha. they were so the stronger and they also show, showed Harlan County. And it was like a thing opened up in my head for the first time. I was stunned by what she, what she brought to life and, and, and what her camera showed. And wow. I wanted to do that. I wanted to do that too. I, I, I love that. And you have. Well, I know one of your biggest productions is Motherhood and Dinah Manoff, who will be here on Wednesday. You two have worked You're together. So lucky. <laughs> I'm, hey, I mean, I grew up on Greece. Like I was, you know, 11 when that movie came out. And Marty <laughs> Maraschino is, yes. you know, embedded in my brain forever. So having the chance to talk to her will be amazing. But you two have worked together a, a number of times. What is that like for a mother to work with her daughter? Um, well, you know, the only thing that I worked with her on was this series where I was a guest, a guest artist yep. Yep. on yes. her show. On yep. her show, and I, I, I was very uncomfortable because, because it, you know, it was a snooty character which I knew <laughs> how to do, but you know, it was like all fast. You know, everybody there was a, it was a series, so they each knew their all their lines and da 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 da, -da. and I felt out out of place that I wasn't at home and she was a character she wasn't dinah she was playing a right, character. right right yeah she was you playing know, the character so i couldn't get rid of it fast enough it was you know it wasn't my home and i and she wasn't my dinah she was somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> well as you mentioned earlier she just released her first novel the real true hollywood story of jackie gold tell us what you thought of it mom well, you know, and and I say this as a, as a reader. It is fucking brilliant. <laughs> not, not, not because it's my daughter. No. I, I, as she can tell you, I'm a very, very big critic. You know, I've t taught too many classes you know, in acting, not to say, no matter who it is, if it's my husband, if it's my daughter, you didn't get it, you didn't do it, you know. But I, I could not put this book down. It is so original, it is so fresh, it is so, and it's got all that Hollywood stuff that she knows about, because she was mm. raised in Malibu, you know. Plus this imagination and this character that she's created. Uh, it's fucking brilliant. I love it. And That's great. I have great. never said that, you know, to her about anything she's written before. It is fucking brilliant. That's great. I realize I didn't say, or we didn't say the name of the series, Empty Nest, earlier when, uh, when you did that. Um, I, I'm curious, you know, she you know, went into this business at a young age as well. Do you, do you recall if you offered her any advice? Well, when she did like her scene for the actor studio, and it was a tell you Tennessee Williams thing, one that I had done at her age when I was hired in stock, you know, um, I tried to give her like, you know, little directorial things. And it really didn't work. <laughs> you know, I'm her mother. And, and and she's directed me, by the way. She's directed me and stuff. When I've gone, she lives on, on this island across from Seattle. And, and she's a wonderful director. But I'm too Stanislavski. 
to be able to have a, a real directorial help for her um, when she was, but she got in anyway. I, I, I was not a good director for her. Hmm. And, and before I let you go, what's the best part of being Nana? Oh, I, I don't know. I'm in love. You know, I have, uh, Dinah has two beautiful boys, Desi and, and it's, I'm not, Desi and who? Oh, tell, uh, I'll, give me a second. I'll tell you. Uh, Oliver and Dushal, right? Desi and Dushal. Uh, Oliver and Desi. Yeah. Oliver, Dinah has these two great boys, Oliver and Desi, both of whom are going to go to college next year, and she's mm -hmm. going to be faced with an empty... Uh, <laughs> an empty nest! An empty nest. <laughs> empty nest. And, uh, and my other daughter, Belinda, has two daughters, um, oh, so you have the boys and the girls. So I have two boys. I have two girls, and and uh, and they love each other. And Belinda and the girls are going to visit Dinah, and the two boys in like two weeks. So um, it's it's a great family, and of course I have my twins. You know I am married to the Fioretti's. Uh, Phyllis Fioretti and Joey Fioretti are twins. And Joey's my husband, and Phyllis, whose bedroom I'm in, talking to you, um, it, it is my. Now you do it this way and not that way, and, <laughs> and so you know I, through all of these years, um, you know we've I've been this little Jew in this uh, Italian bun. And, uh, in this Italian bun, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, hey, it's nothing but eating, you know. Yeah, Ita Ita Italian uh, sandwich. food is, yeah, yeah, Italian sandwich ain't bad. It Italian sandwich ain't I bad. Mean, it, it could not be better. It <laughs> could not be better. Yeah. When very, you look very juicy. When you look back at everything, is there something that just you know, what makes you the happiest when you think about your career? Well, you know, as I said, you know, you're bumping down the, the road, you know, the candid, candida thing. And the fact that, you know, I've lost so many people. Mm -hmm. I have lost, I have lost so many people. And I'm so grateful that with all the twists and turns and, and that we're here and we have each other and in a dangerous, dangerous world that for this time, for this day, for this day, we're safe. For this day, we have each other. And that's a blessing. Yeah. That's a blessing. Well, before I let you go, I got to ask you, 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 you um, make an appearance in Killian and the Comeback Kids that was terrific and written and directed by Taylor A. Perdee. Um, was that fun uh, helping him out? And, and he's a great kid. person. He's a great kid. Yes. He, he's a great kid to me because his mother, Roberta, uh, Babysat Dinah. Oh, and wow. Babysat, babysat uh, Belinda when she okay. was. When she, so, and then she grew up to be my producer and one of the producers that I did all of the documentaries with. That was his mother who grew up within our production. And then she had this baby. <laughs> she had Taylor. And so, you know, she'd wheel him through my doors, through my house, and then Taylor grew up, and we started making 
um, movies together, Taylor and I. So that this whole family construct, you know, the Fioretti's and the Perdis and the Taylors, and you know, this has been a tight braid running through all of our lives from the time that uh, that I first met Roberta and Malibu. Ah, when so you were living in, when, when you were living in paradise. Yes. <laughs> in paradise. Well, yeah. well, Lee, this has been a joy. You are amazing. You have such a great spirit. Great spirit. Thank you so much for doing this. Hey, can we take a quick picture? Of course. Get ready. I'll count us down. Big smiles. One, two, three. Really, you stay well. Everybody, don't forget to check out Lee's Films. You can go right here. It's real-one.com backslash products. Check them all out. And for anyone, I took... I said this online, I posted it for anyone who has not seen Shampoo, see it. It is still, I, I think it is as sexy as it comes. Still hot. Still hot. Still <laughs> hot. And, and, the, and the amount of hair in that movie was something else. For, from the men to the women. I, I, well, <laughs> it's a beauty parlor. You know, yeah, it is, yeah. Yes, hair. yes, Alan, yes. I yeah. want to tell you, you've been lovely you really you. You, you you make me open you know i feel the the goodness and the kindness in you and you're smart and well, thank you for for being such a good questioner thank you so much i hope uh, to see you in person one day oh i would like that <laughs> Bye-bye, Lee. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Bye. Stay there, Lee, for one second, okay? Sure. Stay there one second. I'll say, sign off. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's show. I will see you next week. And don't forget, Wednesday, July 28th, Lee's beautiful daughter, Dinah Manoff, will be right here. Bye, everybody.